All right. Hope everyone's doing all right. I appreciate you guys and gals for joining us here today. My name is Wes Wood. I'm the executive director of InVets. Um, for those of you that don't know, InVets is a nonprofit organization based out of Indiana. We normally travel throughout the United States. We go to military bases. We go to transition assistance programs, talk to folks that are going through that process um, about career opportunities, communities, resources here in the state of Indiana. But given the COVID crisis we're all going through right now. We are not only working from home, as you can see, but uh, we are working at our, you know, each respectful homes around the state and not able to travel. So we're doing our first employer workshop um, today. We hope to maybe continue this, you know, every couple of weeks or so going forward. But the purpose of this is still to provide that, that connection to folks. I know transition doesn't necessarily stop, um, you know, given the certain circumstances, depending on who you are. So uh, throughout this throughout this webinar, we're let's see, let's go to the agenda. We've got four topics we'll be we'll be talking about. First, we'll have Jerry Young, one of our veteran engagement managers, who will talk a little bit about why you should consider Indiana as the next place uh, you make your career move, as well as about our organization, about InVets. After that, Jeremy Higgins will kick us off with talking about LinkedIn and how that is crucial in your job search. Um, and then after that, Blaine Zimmerman will talk about building a better resume, uh, how to tailor that uh, for civilian employers, translating those, those military background uh, specific skill sets. And then after that, I'll be back on and we'll be talking with Mr. Theron Thomas from Crane Naval Surface Warfare Center here in Indiana. Um, so let's see, Jerry, are you on here? Yes, sir. There you are. All right, throughout the time, um, you guys can see the chat there. I'll be monitoring that. Uh, if you guys have any questions, feel free to drop them in there. I'll try to try to address them in between people, as well as at the end, we'll have a short Q&A. So hope you guys enjoy. Hey, thanks, Wes, and welcome, everybody, to the uh, inaugural uh, web event for us. Um, as Wes told you, my name is Jerry Young. I'm a veteran engagement manager here at InVets. I am a two-branch uh, veteran. I started my career off in the Air Force, uh, did nine years on the active duty side, uh, and then I separated, moved back home to Indiana, and then in 2005, after a five-year break in service, uh, joined the Indiana Army National Guard. I uh, served in recruiting command, and then I did a deployment to Afghanistan, 0910, and three years ago, I retired uh, as an infantry platoon sergeant. So some of the things that I'm going to be talking about today um, are going to be, oh, there it is. Sorry, my, I guess uh, my, my, uh, there it is. Hey, so I'm going to be talking about five main benefits today uh, for veterans that uh, moved to Indiana. House Bill 1010 uh, regarding military retirement pay. <clears throat> college tuition for children of disabled veterans and Purple Heart recipients, uh, property tax deductions, and finally, uh, discounted hunting and fishing licenses. So first things first, uh, this is a picture of Governor Eric Holcomb signing House Bill 1010 into effect uh, in uh, August 5th of last year. So essentially, this uh, has full income tax exemption for military retirement pay uh, for veterans that live here in Indiana and it'll be fully implemented on 1 January of 2022, okay? Uh, next, we're gonna be talking about, <clears throat> excuse me, college tuition uh, for children of disabled veterans. Now, you can get this information from our website, but what I wanted to do is go to the www.in.gov uh, forward slash DVA, the state website, and show you where we got our information, okay? Uh, College tuition uh, for children of disabled veterans. Basically, it provides free or discounted college tuition for children that of disabled veterans that joined the military while living in Indiana or if they have lived here for at least five years before using that benefit. OK, so so some of you that have younger children, this might be perfect that you can move here and have your five years in before your kids get to college age. All right. And then the college tuition for Purple Heart recipients. This provides free tuition for children of veterans that entered active duty service while living in Indiana and they uh, received the Purple Heart uh, medal. All right. Now, this slide here is just the bottom of the previous slide. And basically what I wanted to show you um, 
was that at the bottom of this page, you're also going to find the education tab, which is the first one there uh, under the left green arrow. And then there's some more uh, great links to information uh, to veterans benefits <clears throat> in Indiana. All right, next. All right, so property tax deductions. There are several property tax deductions ranging from about $12,500 to $25,000 here in Indiana. Now, I'm very familiar with this one. Uh, my fiance and I are both veterans. She's a Navy vet, and then I'm obviously Air Force and Army veteran. Um, we were not married, but we did buy a house together. So we were able to combine our tax deductions, and now we have over 50, we have right at $50,000 exemption on our tax for our home. So that's pretty great. Uh, Indiana residents um, that are disabled and have a dis uh, excuse me disability rating, you can purchase a hunting and fishing license at a dis at a discounted rate. So a uh, year fishing license in Indiana is seventeen dollars. So I got a ten year license for only twenty seven fifty. So basically, between me and my fiance, we've saved almost three hundred dollars, which is probably going to go to the Cabela's fishing store uh, just up the road from me. All right, so that's kind of a quick overview of just five of the benefits uh, for veterans living in Indiana. Now we're going to start talking about uh, Indiana communities, okay? So in Indiana, you have, you know, your three settings, suburban, urban, and rural. Um, this is a um, our, our website. Uh, when we ask you to fill out your profile, one of the things we're talking about is where do you want to live? North, Northern Indiana, Central Indiana, or Southern Indiana, okay? Now, within those three regions, uh, we have some sub-regions, and there's five distinctive regions in Indiana, and I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, each of them, okay? So, next we have the first region, which is the Northwest region. All right, this is up there on... Uh, Lake Michigan's not too far uh, from Chicago, and we actually refer to it as the region uh, because people up there, they talk a certain way, and they're like, oh, yeah, you're from the region. Yeah, so absolutely. So the northeast, or excuse me, the northwest region um, has approximately 845,000 folks across the urban, suburban, and rural community. Like I said, it's just minutes from Chicago. Households uh, in the Northwest Indiana's median income is uh, about $59,000 a year. And more about the Northwest region can be found at the Northwest Indiana or nwiforum.org. Okay. Next, we have the Northeast region. Northeast region has about uh, 790,000 people uh, living in that area. It's also home to Fort Wayne, uh, Indiana, which is the second largest city. In Indiana. The Northeast region is made up of 11 counties. Uh, it's got a diverse number of communities from urban living within Fort Wayne to some more low-key, smaller communities uh, like Angola and uh, some of the other counties there, uh, the Lake Counties as they call them. All right. Next we have Central Indiana. So in Central Indiana, of course, you'll find the capital of Indianapolis, uh, Central Indiana boasts the state capital as long as the Colt, as long as well as, excuse me, the Colts and the Pacers, a uh, great ultra, uh, arts and cultural district. Um, and there's also a bunch of different local microbrewers, um, various restaurants. So it's a really neat place. Uh, the counties surrounding Indianapolis, um, they're vibrant, great mix of suburban and rural living. I live northeast of the city uh, in uh, Hamilton County. And it's great for me because I don't mind working in the city, but when it comes to being at home, uh, I like to be a little more low key, jump on my bike, go for a ride. So central Indiana, it ranks consistently as one of the most affordable places to live in the country. And the median price of an existing single family home in Indiana is about $194,000. Now that's almost $76,000 lower than the national average. If you want more detailed information on the central Indiana region, specifically in Indianapolis, you can check out visitindy.com. It's a great little site. Okay, southeast region is where we're headed next. Down here, it's a little more rural um, in the southeast region. Uh, the further south you go, you'll start noticing the rolling hills. 
Uh, it's it's really nice. It's kind of kind of rural and country. Uh, got a feel to it, but it has a growing private business sector. It includes a number of innovative defense industry organizations developing um, specific defense technologies such as unmanned systems, uh, robotics, and cybersecurity. Uh, one of the best things about Southeast Indiana is how close it is um, to some great, some other great places in the Midwest, such as Cincinnati, Louisville, and then of course you just go up northwest there a little bit, and you're you're in Indianapolis. So, uh, for more information about Southeast Indiana, visit southeastindiana.com. All right, Southwest region. Last but not least, all right. So the Southwest region uh, of in, of Indiana. It's got about 300,000 people. Uh, it's a little more sparsely uh, populated, uh, but it is home to Evansville, Indiana, which is the third largest city in our state. Um, so you got the rolling hills like you did over in Southeast uh, Indiana. Uh, and it's like I said, it's a little more rural, a little more dispersed outside Evansville and all that. Uh, the whole Southern half of the state sits there right along the beautiful Ohio River Valley. The median household income, uh, for the Southwest Indiana is just over $48,000. And many counties are actually averaging uh, high 50s for their median income there. And if you want more information uh, about that, that region, check out southwestindiana.org. All right, so next we have, this is a graphic map. It's a representation uh, of just some uh, different things that we have here in Indiana. Um, attractions, universities, and whatnot, and then also our close proximity to other uh, major uh, urban centers. All right, so right there in the center of Indiana, you can see Indianapolis. On the bottom, you got the logo for the Colts. Uh, just to the right, the Pacers. And then off to the left, you have the wheel and the, and the little wings there. That's the symbol for the Indianapolis Motor Speedway in Speedway, Indiana, just west of the city. Now, right there uh, on the north side of Indianapolis, we have Butler University. Uh, which I believe is uh, Blaine's alma mater. If you go straight north uh, up to South Bend, Indiana, you see Notre Dame. Northwest, you head up Interstate 65 towards Chicago. That's Purdue University. And then down southwest of Indianapolis uh, in Bloomington, beautiful Bloomington, Indiana, is uh, Indiana University. Yeah. All right. So next we have, oh, I forgot to tell you, I wanted to mention the proximity to some of the cities. Um, so some of the some of the places that we have that are close to Indiana uh, and Indianapolis um, include St. Louis, Missouri, and Columbus, Ohio. So one's to the west, obviously, the other's to the east, both just under four hours away from us. Uh, Chicago to the northwest of us is only about three hours away. Uh, and then Cincinnati and Louisville, both of which are about two hours from Indianapolis. OK, so that kind of gives you a brief overview uh, some of the regions, some basic information. Uh, but now I'm going to shift gears and I want to start talking to you a little bit about NVETS, uh, how we assist veterans and their families uh, transition here to Indiana in the civilian workforce. Mm -hmm. All right. About NVETS. All right. We have about 150 plus uh, employer partners. All right. Throughout the state. We also have over 85,000 open positions in the state of Indiana. On our website, you'll see that we highlight uh, four main pathways for careers in Indiana, healthcare, logistics, manufacturing, and technology. Uh, we're a partner with a number of local, national, uh, local and national veteran service organizations. As you know, we're all veterans, so we're 100% veteran-ran organization. And we like to say that we are the digital connection point uh, for veterans and their families to engage opportunities here in Indiana. So what is our process? It's pretty simple. Um, we're getting ready to drop a new website. Hopefully, I think uh, Wes said today it was going to be out next week. Uh, I'm pretty excited about that. So our process is veterans or spouses come to invets.org and they can build a site, they can build a profile. Uh, once you create the profile, you can look around, explore employer opportunities um, um, on there. Uh, one of the person, one of either me or Jeremy from the veteran engagement team will reach out, say, hey, we saw you built the profile. Tell us a little bit more about yourself. Um, you as a as a veteran and a profile holder can directly connect with employers, uh, follow up, and then we'll follow up with you and your employers uh, once you apply for someplace. 
And then we'll give you some uh, some pointers and some things for uh, assistance actually helping you move to Indiana. Okay, Indiana is participating in the Hilton Honors Military Program, and that provides up to 100,000 hotel points to eligible transitioning service members uh, and veterans to support their need to travel like during uh, interviews or if you're looking for a house. So get on Hilton Honors. You can build your uh, build yourself a little profile on there, and then uh, we can reach out to our contact at the state and connect you with that. Uh, speaking of finding housing, uh, we can also help you find a realtor in the area that you're going to uh, try and find a house and, you know, kind of make it easier on you because you're not from here and you're not sure who to talk to. Uh, Indiana has a program called the Honor Our Vets program, which offers up to $5,000 in relocation assistance uh, when a veteran or spouse is hired by a participating uh, family employer. All right. So this is the uh, the page of our new Invet site. So pretty excited about here. And just like I said, there's the old getting started. So what I wanted to say is uh, one of the things that sets us apart uh, from other organizations is that we do uh, not only assist veterans, but we also assist their spouses. Not all, not all other, uh, other organizations do that. And it's something we're proud of, you know. Uh, our wives and husbands don't necessarily wear the uniform. Some do, but uh, some of them don't. But we do know that they play an integral part of us, you know, being successful and meeting mission success. So uh, we want to support them, too. And this is where that all begins. Once you go from the main page, click on getting started. Uh, this is basically a graphic uh, describing the process that I was talking about a few slides ago. So. What you do, uh, you create a profile and you can apply for positions. Uh, now it's more streamlined. Our new site makes it a little easier for you and uh, the overall operability. Um, so once you build your profile, you'll be visible to our employer partners and they can check you out. And they may reach out to you. Um, once you do check out those careers, you can apply directly uh, through their site that's linked in on our website. Uh, you can submit your application. And then that lets us know that you've applied for that position. Uh, the new site, once you apply, it sends us an email and says, hey, they've applied here. And then that way we can reach out and advocate for you and make sure that that company knows that a veteran's applied for a position there. All right, so if you go in to our site, uh, you can either explore careers by industry or you can explore um, uh, by employer itself. Excuse me, my nose is itching, I'm sorry. Um, so if you want to click uh, industry, uh, you just go up there at the top where it says explore careers, click on that, pop down, and it'll talk about industries. Now, we do have uh, four main industry path career pathways here in Indiana or uh, here on our website, rather. And that's uh, logistics, healthcare, manufacturing and technology. Um, on this slide here, that's if you're going to use the employer portal. But here. Uh, I went ahead and I selected the logistics uh, career path. Down here, uh, it says view industry. When you click on that, it pops up these three little uh, subsections here, uh, which are the three main career paths, supply chain, uh, driver, and then uh, vehicle maintenance. Okay, and then you can dig further into those and see if uh, any of those are a fit for you. Down at the bottom, you can see in the career overview, it says that we have the median salary uh, for logistics, uh, the national wide, it says jobs nationwide by 2018, excuse me, and then approximate number of new jobs by 2028. So you get some information about not what it's only happening in Indiana, but how these uh, skills may translate um, if you go someplace else. All right. Sorry about that. I hit the wrong button on my computer. Okay. So um, here, let's see. All right. So that's it for my portion of this event. As you can see, uh, Indiana is very veteran friendly and we have a lot of benefits for veterans and their family when they choose to come here. And uh, all of us here at InVets, you know, that's what we're here to do is to assist you guys along the way from when you start your transition to getting a house and getting moved in. Uh, we want to be a part of that, getting you set up um, with a new successful life. So 
thank you. Thanks for coming today. Uh, thanks for, you know, hanging out. Next up is Jeremy Higgins. He's another veteran engagement manager with our team. And he's going to talk to you about the amazing world of LinkedIn, which is pretty amazing. So thank you guys. And I hope you have a great day. Thanks, Jerry. All right. So I'm going to get Jerry switched out with Jeremy. So just to touch on what Jerry went over for a second, I know there's a lot of information about our program out there and about the state. Um, I just wanted to highlight kind of the key thing that we do, the, the key value proposition that we offer transitioning service members and their spouses is we provide a connection point to these companies across Indiana that specifically want to get in touch with that veteran population. Uh, we don't have any major military bases here in Indiana, so we serve as kind of that connection point. Um, this new website, we're really excited about it. It's going to launch next week. Um, that's going to allow us to do a, a more seamless handoff to those companies and make sure that if at, all, if at all possible, we can get you plucked out of that stack of, of general applicants and, and recognized for your military service. Um, we hope to be a great asset in your search, but it still requires you know you guys to be proactive on your own. So Jeremy's here. He's going to talk about LinkedIn and some of those ways you can utilize some other resources to supplement our services um, in your transition. Jeremy. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Jeremy Higgins, and as uh, Jerry already shared, I'm the Veteran Engagement Manager. And uh, what uh, my my career started off in '91. I went ahead and uh, retired out in 2015 from the AGR program here in the state of Indiana. Uh, after uh, the last 11 years, I was uh, with the Indiana National Guard in that capacity. So. Uh, but I live up here in northern Indiana, or up in northeastern Indiana. So I was born and raised in Bremen, and uh, now I live uh, over by Fort Wayne. So I've got a wife and a couple of kids that live with me and two that are outside the house. So I can definitely relate uh, to different uh, capacities as far as when it comes to veterans and, and otherwise as far as the trials and tribulations as such. So... Uh, straight away uh, today, uh, we're, uh, what I'm going to cover is is uh, LinkedIn and uh, really why it's important to the transitioning service member. So first, let's go over uh, as far as some simple facts about LinkedIn. Now, what LinkedIn does is they provide a free uh, premium subscription for your first year out. Now, that's uh, that's quite a bit as far as when it comes from an organization extending that and the fact that it's $64 a month. So you can see that's a pretty generous offer. Now what this can do for you is what we're going to discuss. Now what I like to do is use the analogy of would you leave $64 on the sidewalk? Of course you're not going to. You're going to pick it up and use it. So straight away think of that when you're going ahead and not going with LinkedIn because some people don't. Um, now 87% of recruiters in the United States use LinkedIn in some capacity. And there's 133 million users. So you can understand that uh, the pertinence and relevance is finding a new position and career really comes to bear. And when it all comes down to, it's not necessarily what you know anymore, it's who you know in that capacity that can get you to that next step effectively. So what you really wanna take a look at is, is networking. You know, so it's all about networking, getting your name out there, getting a good reputation and going going forth and doing great things because networking is only one syllable away from not working. So think about it in that capacity. So the importance of a profile. I can't say enough about uh, the importance of a profile and the fact that it's your first uh, instance as far as meeting somebody on, on this uh platform. So specifically, look at it like a handshake. You want to come across as a as a professional uh, in your field. Uh, I don't necessarily recommend that you do it in a military uniform, not saying anything against it, but you want that civilian workforce to be able to relate to you. So make sure that you come across and basically give them, you know, so that's a good thing in some capacity because it shares with them that. But you also want to go ahead and put something else like you know, you're passionate about this or you want to go ahead and share a certification or different things that that uh, would catch an employer's eye. 
Now, your summary is going to really show who you are as far as it shows your intestinal fortitude as far as on paper. You're going to show the fact that you're different than other people out there because you had the capacity to work through different things. And the item that you really want to exemplify is the fact that making yourself different than somebody else. So in that capacity, there's a lot of us that use acronyms to their fullest. I, I'm guilty, of course, you know, and the whole thing is, is, is make sure that you make it civilian word speak. There's nothing worse than somebody, uh, you know, putting some acronyms in there, doing different things that as far as in your job descriptions that are going to go ahead and uh, basically that person's going to kind of look at it and they're like, I, I don't know what this says. I know it's important, but I don't know what it says. So make sure that it's readable on both capacities and it makes sense. So what you can do with LinkedIn. So it's all about you when it comes to LinkedIn. It's not about the we anymore. It's you and separating yourself from your peers, separating yourself from that specific team because you're joining a new team. So pick those strategic connections. Pick that specific company that you want to work for or that industry and start to make connections. Um, there's one item that you want to make sure that you do is making sure that they know that you're available. They know that you're interested in their company and you'd like to come over there and make a difference. So and that's really, really what's going to set you apart. Now, one item that uh, is very very, uh, it's, it's one of those things that helps you out a lot that not a lot of people know about, which is basically setting up your mobile app. Now, when you go to career fairs, this is going to help out greatly in the fact that you can then focus on connections and focus on making that first impression, focus on, you know, finding out about different companies and doing different capacities and the fact that, hey, because it's going to pick up on all those LinkedIn users within 100 feet. So then you can just send out connection requests with specific messages, different questions that maybe came up in the, in the uh, you know, as far as in, in, talking with them and engaging them. So that, that's a great help. You know, make sure people know when you're available. Um, one thing that I've noticed about transitioning is the fact that nobody seems to share that. So make sure that you put, I'll be available to work on said date because that's gonna basically go ahead and let people know I can start work then. And I hate to say this, but I was an HR manager for three years. And the one item that I never liked is the fact that if I bring somebody in for an interview or talk to somebody and do a phone interview and then find out they're not gonna be available for two months. So just make sure you set that expectation. Highlight your experiences, make sure you showcase your current skills and Definitely go ahead and communicate your objectives. So the best practices on LinkedIn. Uh, one item is, is when you send a connections request, send a message. goes without saying, like I said, it's, it's just like your profile picture. It's going to go ahead and set the tone, the fact that you want to position there. You want to go ahead and dedicate time every day. Uh, even if it's like five or 10 minutes to go ahead and get into your LinkedIn, check your messages, send out a couple connection requests. And like I said, even if it's five minutes, it's five minutes that's going towards that next career. Make sure that you comment on posts that are out there that you feel you know strongly about or in your industry or something that as far as or someone that uh, basically is going to further yourself in your career. Um, now make sure when you comment, it's a competent, confident statement in the fact that that uh, that it's true to the fact and it, it doesn't have like any spelling error or stuff like that. Unfortunately, I'm guilty of that occasionally, but make sure that it, it, it hits home. So use your cold chat messages. These are your connections that you don't know. Um, they're not in your network. You can't make a connection unless you actually reach out to them. You're going to get 15 of those a month, but make sure that uh, 
If you don't use them, you'll notice that they're going to go ahead and compile up. So it, that allows for you as you get closer to maybe make more connections or make, you know, to go ahead and try to further stuff if you're in a bind towards the end there. Um, LinkedIn Learning. Now, I can't say enough about that. This uh, basically shows you, and this is a, a great aspect of that first year, it gives you the ability to uh, poise that lifelong learner concept as well. It's going to give you some great tips. There's a uh, 17 plus, it's like 17 hours and 31 minutes that actually goes over transitioning military. That is going to give you some best practices, tips about LinkedIn. It's also going to help assist you in a, a lot of different things that are going to make you successful. And one of them is setting up uh, your personal URL as far as on LinkedIn, you know, because it goes without saying you don't necessarily just want that profile that's out there. You want to make it, like I said, the more detailed, the more items that you can show an employer that you know and what you want to do, um, the further you're going to get. Network after business hours, prime time, 6.30 to 8.30 every night. People are basically, they get home, uh, they eat dinner with the family, and uh, if they're like me, I don't necessarily watch TV so much. I actually get on LinkedIn and check some stuff out, check my messages. I go outside, do projects. But the big item is, is like I said, I check LinkedIn for messages, connections, different items that I need to follow up on. Make sure you network after business hours. Like I said, it could be as little as 5, 10, 15 minutes. Whatever you can dedicate to it, dedicate to it because it's going to help further your process. Now, my experience is on LinkedIn. Initially, I can tell you, I didn't really drink the Kool-Aid, so to speak. You know, so I, I checked it out. I set up a profile. I set out a couple of connections. I didn't fully understand what I was doing, um, but I knew that I had to do it. So it was kind of a rough patch in the beginning. Now, my learning curve doesn't need to be your learning curve. Make sure, like I said in the beginning, use those strategic connections. Get on that. And, and uh, as far as further yourself in the industries you're interested in. And the importance of this, it's like I said in the beginning, it's not what you know, it's who you know. Now, I can tell you where I'm at now. Um, I like to go ahead. Um, I've actually had over 6,200 connections right now. And I'm not saying you have to do that. If you're focused on your industry, it may be as little as, you know, two, 300 connections. But those are the ones you want to focus on. And you don't want the minutia in your out there as far as, you know, getting different people. So be careful when you get requests, make sure that's pertinent to what you want to do, not necessarily what they want to uh, further. So make sure that you have, you know, as far as that, that focus. Um, now, like I said, 6,200 connections for me, it allows me to go ahead and do uh, our secondary mission, which is basically furthering stuff for, other veterans outside the state of Indiana. We just basically, you know, give them some connections, help them network into those decision makers. And that's what's really important is, is to help our brothers and sisters out there as far as to go ahead and take those next steps and great careers. Uh, my goal this year on LinkedIn is to go ahead and get about, you know, 10 to 12,000 connections so that I can assist and do what I'm passionate about, which is helping veterans take that next step. Next, we've got Blaine Zimmerman, Zimmerman and uh, he's, uh, of course, my boss. Uh, and uh, he'll be talking to you about uh, building a better resume. Hey, Jeremy, real quick, we've got a question sure. from Christopher. Could you go over again what a cold chat message is? Sure. Uh, a cold chat message is uh, basically going to go ahead and send a communication out to somebody that's outside of your network. So it... Um, You'll notice that uh, you don't have, you can't have any connections to that person. It'll be outside your industry, outside of your circle. So that's what a cold connection is. Thanks. Yep. All right. I'm going to cycle you off and I'll bring on Blaine. Yes, sir. I apologize for those of you that have had some had some connection issues or audio issues. Uh, this is the first time we've utilized this platform. So, um, you know, we did several test runs, thought we had the kinks worked out. But, you know, I'm sure there's still more we could more we could learn. All right. 
So again, I highly recommend um, utilizing LinkedIn going forward. Um, you know, a lot of, I know a lot of times, especially with veterans, I know myself included, when we got out of the military, a lot of us aren't super engaged in social media. Um, it's just not a big part of military life for everybody. Um, but this really is different than most other platforms, and it really can be a great asset to getting connected with those decision makers that can actually get you a job and also a great asset in learning more about a company, you know, potentially reaching out to somebody at that company that's not in the hiring process necessarily, but, you know, it can give you that insight. You know, a lot of times I talk to folks and tell them that, you know, for that first year, year, that first job you take after the military, the company you land at is much more important than the job you get. You know, I always recommend find the right company, get your foot in the door, take that first job and crush it. But while you're crushing that first job, you can kind of look around, figure out what other roles are within that company. It's much easier to, to navigate internally within a company to a different position than trying to come in from the outside. So make sure you do that, that employer research. Let's see. I think Blaine got booted in the joining process, but he's coming back in now. We'll see if this works. All right. Hey everybody. There he is. Sorry about that. Had some technical difficulties logging on. <laughs> That's all right. All right. I'll let you take it. Hey everybody. I'm Blaine Zimmerman. I'm the uh, director of veteran engagement. want to start by saying thanks Jerry and Jeremy uh, for telling us about InVets and how great Indiana is and giving us some great tips on LinkedIn. That was great advice and uh, really appreciate it. Really appreciate everybody coming on today. Thanks for taking the time out of your day right in the middle of the day, or if you're in a different time zone, whatever time it is there. Uh, really appreciate everybody coming in and uh, listening to us speak and tell us tell you a little bit more about our organization. So some of my background, spent six years in active duty between Fort Bliss and Fort Drum, been to Iraq and Afghanistan, and I made the transition back in 2014. I was an E5 at the time and I've stayed in the guard since then. So I've got 12 years of total service. Uh, since I've been out, I earned my MBA from Butler University back in 2017 and then uh, became an officer, went over to the dark side in uh, 2019 and went to infantry basic officer leadership course. Just finished in March and right, uh, right when I got back to Indiana, started here at InVets. So that kind of gets us up to date. And what we're going to talk about today is how to improve your resume to really uh, make it as best as possible to put your be best foot forward to get that interview. So what you'll probably hear me talk about a lot is your resume is really the key to the door to unlock it, to open the door to that interview room. That's your goal with a resume. That's the one thing that's keeping you from interviewing for a position. You can be a perfect fit for a role, but if your resume doesn't say that, you're never going to talk to a human being to be able to show them and that you're perfect for that role and that you uh, have the skills that they need as an employer. So I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about some resume do's and don'ts. Then I'm going to pull up my resume and show you as a, like a case study of some of those do's and don'ts just so you can see it in practice. So the first do, make sure your contact uh, information is at the top of your resume. I know I've hired people before and you really, once you're ready to make that interview call, uh, you want to be able to find their contact information really quickly. And so if it's not at the top, they have to go search for it. It's There's a good chance that could be the difference between you getting a re, uh, in an interview or your resume getting thrown in the trash. You want to have a personal uh, email. Don't use your .mil account, use your personal account and then make sure that it's professional. So this is the time to get rid of the I love the Steelers 79 or the Hello Kitty 43. Um, and I would suggest using some sort of variation of your name. Try to avoid numbers if you can. Understandably, if your name's Adam Smith, uh, you may have to throw a number or two on the back end, but try to use a, a variation of your name. On the other side of that, uh, I would suggest using an email server such as Gmail. So if you have an old uh, email address that might be AOL.com or Hotmail, some employers might see that as a little bit out of touch with current technology. So I would suggest just updating that to a Gmail account or a Yahoo or something um, that employers are used to seeing. Make sure your resume is easy to read. Uh, if it's really weird and wonky or you have a lot of uh, different fonts or different colors, 
uh, it's going to be distracting and it's going to take away from you and your skills. So kind of going, jumping over to one of the don'ts, don't overuse color colors or patterns or anything like that. I mean, your eyes have probably looked at that bullet point four or five times in the three minutes I've been talking. Make sure you have an executive summary at the top of your resume. That summary should change based on the job that you're applying for. Even if you apply to more than one job with one position or with one company, you want it to be different for the different positions. You want that executive summary to be a one to two sentence summary explaining why you're the best fit for that role. Use quantitative metrics when you can. So for those of you that have written evaluation reports for either NCOs or officers or have received them in your career, you know that those quantitative metrics are super important. So the percentage of uh, training that you've done, the number of soldiers that you've trained, the dollar amounts for your budgets, those are the types of things employers want to see. It helps you stand apart from the crowd and it helps show that you're ready for that role in their position and that you're going to be the best bet to help their company thrive. Don't be afraid to add any uh, personal activities or professional associations to your resume. They can show that you're really well-rounded and sometimes those personal activities or professional associations have specific things that fit in with the job you're looking to do. One example is if you're a spouse and you are the leader of the FRG, it shows that you have project management experience. It shows you have budgeting experience. You may not have a direct uh, previous job that shows those skills, but that leader of the FRG or the family readiness group, it does show that you've done those things in the past and that you are uh, skilled in them and that will help for the next job that you're looking for. Some don'ts, try to keep it under two pages. Uh, for, a, for normal jobs, for people, for hiring managers, they aren't gonna spend time going through a seven page resume. There are statistics out there that say most hiring managers aren't gonna look at a resume for more than a minute. If your resume is more than two pages, they're not going to look at it. There are exceptions to that rule, though. So there are jobs on usajobs.com, jobs that we're going to hear Theron talk about, that some of those employers do expect to see some of the longer resumes with more of the technical experience. In those cases, a lot of times what we do is we'll help you uh, get in contact with one of our partners, with his, which is Operation Job Ready Vets, and they have resume builders on site that'll help you build those resumes for those specific types of roles. Don't use military lingo. I know Jer Jeremy talked about this a little bit, but it's really important that you understand that it's not the, re the employer's job to translate your experience into what they're hiring for. It's your job to translate what you've done into showing them that you're the right fit for that role. I'll go over a little bit, I'll go over that a little bit more when we look at my resume. You don't necessarily need to hide gaps in your employment. It happens sometimes. They're easily explainable and it will come up in the interview. Most of the time, this isn't gonna stop you from opening that door into the interview room. Job gaps happen and it's not gonna be a huge detriment to your success. Don't send your resume as a Word document, convert it to a PDF. Word has different versions and some companies have older versions, some companies have newer versions of Word and when you translate the word in between versions, you can screw up the formatting. It'll come across real, real weird looking. You don't want that to happen. The best way for that to not happen is to convert it to a PDF because then you know that the person on the other end is going to see the exact resume that you sent them. Lastly, don't forget spell check. It's, I just looked at a resume the other day that within four seconds, I found three spelling errors. It's a really quick way to turn an employer off and thinking that you're not very good at attention to detail. And it's one of the things that we tout as a member of the military is that we have great attention to detail. On top of that, there are things that spell check won't, won't catch. So make sure you're going over that resume with a fine tooth comb. Also have a friend or a mentor look at your resume. You're going to be applying to multiple jobs, maybe 25 to 50 trying to make that transition. You're gonna spend so much time looking at your resume that it really helps to get an additional two, three sets of eyes on your resume to catch those little things that you may have missed. So with all that, let's check out my resume and we will go through a lot of these, um, we'll go through these tips. So this is my resume right now. As you can see at the top, it shows 
my contact information is really readily available. If I were to give this new employer and they wanted to interview me, my phone number is right there. My email address is right there. It is a variation of my name and it's Gmail address. Uh, it's really easy to remember. They know it's me. And then we go into my executive summary. So it's a one sentence summary that explains my past and everything you're about to read on the resume in a really short, concise way that says I'm the perfect person for this job. It shows that I have experience in both the startup, nonprofit and corporate worlds, as well as uh, an MBA from Butler University and my military experience. Um, this is a good spot where you can put in the position you're applying for and the company you're applying for. I tend to change this entire thing uh, anytime that I was looking for a new job. So talking about some uh, formatting. So you can see all of my headers are very similar, are exactly the same. They follow the, there's the dates, then the title, then the name of the company. All of the titles are in a specific color and everything is very clear as to how it's separated. Mine is chronological. There's another type of resume out there um, in which you don't do things chronologically, but chronological is the one that most employers are looking for. So quantitative metrics. You can see that I've talked about, you know, three product user groups, five different companies, uh, 20 accounts, uh, top 10 representatives, things like that are the types of things that help you stand out in a crowd. We'll dive a little bit deeper into this when we look at my military experience here. So as I said before, I've got 12 years in the Army and obviously I've done more than one job, right? So I don't really have space to be able to put every single job I had in the military. And frankly, not all of them are relevant to what I'm doing. So I put my entire active duty experience into one of the roles that I did that makes the most sense for what I'm trying to do as a career. Training and development manager. On the Army side, that's called a schools NCO. Notice I didn't call it a schools NCO, and that's because employers don't know what a schools NCO is. To be frank, most employers may not even know what an NCO is. So I looked at what the role was, which was I was responsible for all of the training in the battalion, as well as making sure that uh, each of our soldiers got the developmental training that they needed for their career. Put that together, training and development manager, it works in the corporate world. An employer is going to read that and have a pretty good understanding of what that means, and they don't have to try to interpret anything. Metrics. Don't get over, overly flowery, flowery with your metrics. Make sure that you find what you did in the military that was unique and that will make you stand out from other people that are in that resume stack. So an 800 person organization, that is roughly the size of a battalion. A $500,000 budget, that's about the amount of budget that I had to be able to send soldiers to school throughout the calendar year. The 65 to 94% across six departments. So the six departments, those were the six companies in the battalion and the 65%, the reason we had dropped to that was because we had just come back from a deployment. So naturally coming back from a deployment, you're going to have multiple soldiers that are ETSing and PCSing and things like that. So naturally a lot of those people that were in the trained positions to make a battalion deployable were gone. So I had to create a project management system, find all of the places where uh, we were lacking in training and fill those positions over the course of the next year. That's really important for an employer to see that you're able to find a problem, find a solution to that problem, and then implement it successfully. On the education side, some people like to see the education on the top of your resume. Some people like to see the resume or education on the bottom. It's really up to you. Uh, I would say that it just really depends on your experience level. So if you're an entry level type employee, you might want to put your education at the top. Specifically, if you went to school while in the military, it shows that while you are doing a full time job, you are a student and you have really good time management skills. I did put only one of the schools that I attended in the military just because it was the most recent. And then the other thing that I want to uh, highlight is if you did attend a school but did not graduate, don't hesitate to put that on your resume. I attended Indiana State, but you can see the differences. It doesn't say the name of the degree. It says I was a double major because I did not graduate. I do, I do keep this on my resume because it does show uh, an extra version of education that I've had, as well as some extracurriculars that I've done that kind of highlight some of that time management and being an athlete. It's really important. Um, you know, to be able to show up at the right place, the right time and the right uniform, which is 
very similar to what we do in the military. So the skills section. So this is where I want to talk about applicant tracking systems. So I know that some of the folks that are in our employers and they're very familiar with applicant tracking systems or applicant tracking software. And they'll also uh, be able to reiterate that that software is looking for those keywords that are within the uh, job description that have to be in the resume before a resume will ever see a human being's eyes. This is a good place to put some of those that maybe didn't fit within the paragraphs or the bullets at the top of your resume. If you don't have those keywords in your resume, there's a really good chance that that robot applicant tracking system will fil filter your resume out and it will never see a human being's eyes. And you could be the perfect candidate for that role. And no hiring manager at the company would even know that you applied because that applicant tracking system would take it out of the pile. So you really want to make sure that you understand what the keywords are within that job description and you make sure they're integrated into your resume. If you don't know what those keywords are, work with your SFL TAPS program, work with us, work with operations job ready vets, ask some friends, maybe ask some other people in the industry, make sure that you have a good understanding of that so you can put your best foot forward with, re with your resume. Finally, uh, personal uh, extracurricular activities and professional associations. So this is where you could add in that you were an, you're a member of the American Legion or you led your company's uh, family re readiness group. For me, I put one of uh, my activities, which I'm a co-host of a podcast called Veteran Cast. It highlights members of the veteran community here in Indianapolis. And it really helped me get this current position because it shows that I have a passion for highlighting veteran initiatives and that uh, I've done the work for free on the volunteer side before and I have experience. So don't be afraid to put those in there. It can really highlight your resume and really help you stand apart from the crowd. So that is our 10,000 foot view of resumes. And uh, if you guys have any questions, you know, I'll be around for a while. Uh, I see Jason McCormick uh, asked if you could send the resume over, feel free. Uh, shoot the resume over to us. You can send it to uh, me, Jerry, or Jeremy. Our, re our emails are just our first name, so blaine at invets.org. Um, we'd be happy to go over that and see if there's anything we can help with. Um, we'd also be, we'd love to connect you with Operation Job Ready Vets with their resume building program. Um, yeah, so to answer your question, yes, whatever we can do to help, we can help with resumes for sure. Uh, I definitely want to take the time to thank everybody for coming again. Thanks, Jerry and Jeremy. And I'm going to pass it off to Wes, who's going to talk to Theron Thomas from Crane Naval Surface Warfare Station down in southern Indiana. All right. Thanks, Blaine. All right. All right. Like Blaine said, I highly recommend you, you know, connect with us, follow us on, on LinkedIn, we're on other social media platforms as well. But LinkedIn is probably the best um, to get kind of a, you know, sustained tempo of updates as far as companies we're working with, um, job openings that we know about, events like this that are going on. Um, LinkedIn's kind of where it's at. Let's see. So uh, Theron's in the process of joining us right now. So um, we've worked with Theron for probably about two years now with Crane Naval Base. It's an amazing facility. He'll, he'll take you on a little bit deeper dive of, of what they have to offer. You there, Theron? Yep, sure am. All right. Here so I'll let you, uh, you know, share your screen. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, good afternoon. I came in just a little bit late there. Uh, I was trying to get connected and I uh, missed what you had said, but as I'm bringing the, I will uh, introduce myself. I'm a retired Sergeant Major. I spent 30 years uh, active duty working uh, in the Indiana National Guard um, and uh, retired and I went to work at Crane at the uh, Naval Surface Warfare Center. And uh, let's see here, screen share, there we go. All right, so I think everybody can see that. Uh, look, looking good, Wes. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right, so um, Naval Service Warfare Center Crane. Everybody here is a veteran, more than likely. You may have a spouse or something listening in that isn't as quite maybe as aware as, as what I'm talking about. But um, Crane is a, a Navy base here in Indiana. It happens to be the third largest Navy base in the world. Um, 
and I work for the Naval Surface Warfare Center. So it, you can imagine if you were at Campbell and I said I work for the, you know, uh, some, some maintenance company in the 101st, I wouldn't be talking about the entire organization. So I want to get that clear up front uh, that I am the largest organization on the Naval on the Navy base. But there's Army contingent, there's uh, Naval facilities, there's NSA, there's a ton of other ones. And the reason I want to put that out there up front is I'm going to give you a presentation. And uh, I don't want you to get discouraged because uh, many veterans I talk to are not engineers. Um, they're not scientists. And that is the vast majority of what we hire. But I also know that some of you probably have some GI Bill money sitting out there just waiting to be used. And uh, let's see. I think I went off the screen share. Let me go back and try that one more time. There we go. Let's try this. So Crane is located in uh, southern Indiana. We were about a 25-minute uh, drive southwest of Indiana, uh, located between uh, uh, Bloomington and Evansville, closer to Bloomington than Evansville, right along the 231 I-69 junction. Uh, NAVC is who we work for. We are the federal government, and we uh, work under the Department of Navy, under the department called NAVC, and we are a surface warfare center. You'll see some other ones here that are like Naval Underwater uh, Warfare Center, um, that type of thing, Naval Air Warfare Center, we are, an under, we are a surface warfare center. So what exactly does that mean? Uh, well, I'll get to that. Um, this is just kind of an overview of what we are. We, we uh, go through about $1.4 billion a year handoffs. Uh, we have three primary mission areas, which I'm going to go a little bit more in depth on. Uh, that's strategic, expeditionary, and electronic warfare. Uh, you can see 67% uh, of our employment base are scientists and engineers, technicians, and uh, the rest are our business, finance, that type of thing. Um, uh, we do have about 102 doctorates. Uh, that's up a little bit, 616 master's degrees. This uh, 3471, we're actually up to a little over 3,800 now. Uh, we're hiring uh, a couple of hundred a year or more. Um, so this is our mission statement. Uh, those in the military get it. Uh, this is one of the things we're required to put up there. But it basically tells you that in these three areas, we support the warfighter. Every single thing we do at Crane uh, goes to support the warfighter. Now, some people immediately say, well, wait a minute, you said your Navy, what about others? We, we work for everybody. We do work for the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps, the Missile Defense Agency. We partner with NASA, some friendly federal governments, our uh, friend, uh, friendly states, uh, countries. So uh, we do a lot there. Let me go ahead and bump on over. So strategic missions. Um, you see the giant submarine there? Strategic missions is primarily support for that submarine and its systems. Uh, mostly the, uh, the Trident sub-launched nuclear missile, about 137,000 pounds. We do everything from uh, guidance systems to uh, the, the exchange system for maintenance. A lot of anti-tamper stuff here, too. Uh, one of the, the issues, as I'm sure most of you are aware, are, is that um, we're behind. The United States is behind. We don't have a whole lot of actual technology uh, industry here. Uh, you know, we, 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 we build computers, but we don't build the processors and things for them. So... Um, when we talk about anti-tamper, uh, we're making sure that when we buy parts, if they come from outside the United States, that they've not been set up to um, uh, give a disadvantage to our warfighters, that there's some sort of uh, system in there that will turn over secrets to the enemy, that type of thing. Uh, printed circuit design, um, flight engineering, uh, fire control systems, those types of things. So a lot of, a lot of the, the higher level strategic missions, you guys get what that is. Expeditionary is... Uh, probably a little bit more near and dear to your heart if you're an enlisted man or, or ground pounder like Jerry and some of the others have already said. Uh, these guys do everything from small arms. I'm talking rifles and pistols and uh, sniper weapons, those types of things, all the way up to uh, 30 millimeter. The, the chain gun you see there on the insertion boat, uh, uh, you know, that, that comes from crane. Uh, almost everything on that ship, as a matter of fact, uh, the boat comes from crane. Uh, surveillance systems, uh, night vision, electrical optical uh, systems, uh, those types of things. We've got a a, uh, a library of weapons at Crane, uh, small arms that goes all the way back to the uh, beyond the Civil War era, all the way up to to weapons that you have never seen because they were uh, experimental, and uh, they they go back and research those sometimes to pull them out and re you know take a look at them again. Uh, the G Boss system, if you're familiar with that, you've been overseas recently. Uh, that's a that's a uh, surveillance system comes out of crane it's a like a telescoping boom that has all kinds of sensor arrays and things on it um 
again very high tech stuff but in this area here you can probably tell there's a little bit more hands-on um just because you're an armor in the army uh probably won't land you a job out there because even the people that are uh, doing the maintenance on the weapons a lot of them have engineering degrees and that type of thing so again uh, very uh, high-tech electronic warfare this one's near and dear to my heart in fact uh, when I was in the, the guard I got deployed to uh, Iraq in 2006 and uh, you know we, we battled IEDs every single day I won't go into the lengthy story but suffice it to say you know I saved my life and everybody in my unit as a matter of fact uh, we didn't have any casualties, um, well, any, any deaths from IEDs while we were there, mainly because of the uh, crew system. I get back and I find out that the majority of work for the crew system is actually done at Crane. It was essentially invented there. Uh, so that's great. Uh, a lot of counter electronic uh, measures for aircraft, that type of thing. Um, you know, it's, <laughs> you see this great recruiting poster here, this aircraft. You know, we, we, we show things like that and people get all excited, but in all reality, this little thing that hangs underneath here it looks like it has a propeller on the front. That's really what we do at Crane. Uh, more of the jamming systems, uh, uh, counter electronic type stuff. Um, so that's kind of a quick overview. I know you know we're going kind of fast, but I want to leave some time for some Q and A. Uh, the highest demand we have is electrical engineers, computer engineers, computer scientists, mechanical engineers. However, as I said before, only around six seventy percent of our uh, uh, 3,800 people are engineers and scientists. We do have some business also uh, looking for finance specialists. Uh, if you have a degree, uh, any degree, as a matter of fact, and you have 24 credits of business, um, we have contracting uh, specialist positions open uh, almost all the time. Um, currently, we are uh, about uh, PZ clean for the year on um, uh, positions. However, there's some uh, uh, rumors floating around that we may uh, get authorized to hire another 30 to 60 people uh, here within the next few uh, few weeks. And when that comes out, of course, we'll have a little bit higher uh, recruiting push. So the question always comes up, well, how in the world do I apply at Crane? Because it's a federal government agency. Uh, USA Jobs is a nightmare. How do I do that? Well, the fact of the matter is we honestly, we don't use USA Jobs very much. Uh, this Crane underscore recruiting at Navy.mil. If you want to send your resume there, we'll definitely take a look at it. If you're not qualified, um, we'll probably send you out some information and tell you to look at our contracting partners because um, at the end of the day, the majority of our uh, uh, blue collar work or hands on type work is done by contractors. Uh, we have scientists and engineers to invent really cool things to support the warfighter. But when it comes down to painting those or rubbing the rust off of them or, you know, you know, that type of thing, contractors essentially do that type of work along with a lot of other jobs that's not all we have electrical engineers who are contractors also uh, of course u.s citizenship is required for all positions at crane because everybody who works at my agency it has to be at least qualified for a secret clearance or higher uh, some of us don't hold a clearance all the time but you have to be qualified and you do go through periodic uh, examinations so that's kind of a brief overview we uh we also did i want to leave this up for a few minutes here but uh i did a uh, podcast, as a matter of fact, with uh, Jerry and Wes a few months ago. If you want to really hear about Crane um, and get a good in-depth overview, uh, that podcast is excellent. Uh, I'm not tooting my own horn on it. I'm just saying that it, it's a much more uh, in-depth uh, view, and and, and, and you learn a lot more about it. You know, we've got about, uh, well, the, the, the base is about the size of Washington, D.C., as a matter of fact, and it's about 90% woodland. Uh, if you're a white-tailed deer hunter or turkey hunter or, you know, fisherman or any of that stuff. I mean, of course, with the COVID thing, that's been shut down a little bit. But uh, as an employee, you've got all those types of benefits. You can come down and hop on a bicycle and ride for, you know, six hours in the evening and never see another person. So uh, great place to work. The other nice thing, going back to what Jerry talked about earlier, um, if you stand at Crane and, you get, you know, depending on which azimuth you point at, you're going to hit farmland to small cities to its college town um we're about an hour and 15 minutes from evansville we're 25 minutes from bloomington um just about any place you want to live if you move and come to work at crane uh you're, you're going to find it uh if you want to own a little farm you can if you want to live in the college town you can so i'm going to stop the screen share and uh i guess go back to talking to west for a second here and uh, ask if there's any questions or uh that i can help with um 
I am the affinity recruiter. My primary purpose at Crane is uh, recruiting underrepresented groups. That includes veterans, disabled veterans, uh, anything like that. But I also recruit anybody. So um, my focus is primarily on business. Uh, Mr. John Beings is my partner. He uh, is the STEM recruiter. Uh, but all of those resumes, that, that uh, email that was up there, the Crane underscore recruiting, I see every single one of those resumes when they come in. I'm the first point of contact on every single one of those. So um, what you heard from uh, Blaine on the uh, the resumes, uh, absolutely. Uh, with us, a smaller resume, but if you're looking on USA Jobs, you've got to get a little bit more in depth. Um, if you have questions, you feel free to reach out to me. You can you can hit me right there at that email address and say, hey, Mr. Thomas, you know, I was thinking about going to college. What should I do type thing? I'll afford you some you know, recommendations. I can't make that decision for you, but uh, I can certainly tell you where high paying jobs are and where the job market looks at because because uh, we're a good representation of it, along with uh, uh, some of the other bigger industries here in Indiana. Wes? Yeah. So, yeah, I appreciate it. And and one of the things I wanted to touch on, too, is, you know, you mentioned that there are a bunch of other entities that are stationed at Crane, both yeah. government, you know, direct employment jobs, as well as, um, right. you know, those contractors. So I know we work with a few of those contractors ourselves and, you know, they're looking for a whole spectrum of, of skill sets, backgrounds. I mean, if you want to go into IT, there's there's a ton of yeah. positions in that area. Yeah. Um and one good thing about about I was going to say good thing about that region, but really it's it's kind of statewide, is that we all kind of work together. You know, oh, if, yeah, yeah. if somebody yeah. sends you a resume, expresses an interest, and you don't have something, you'll Absolutely. you'll send them in the right direction. And yeah. and there's some great groups down in that area that really do try and work together. Um, and yeah, I've got a point office. of contact at ROI Regional Opportunities Initiative, and that the guy that I talked to, he retired from Crane his entire purpose in life at this point is to try to bring veterans into Indiana and to ensure veterans in Indiana have jobs, just like you guys do. But he has mm -hmm. uh, points of contact at all of the industries and in what they call the Indiana Uplands region, which is essentially the Southern part of the state. If I get a veteran resume and it doesn't fit at Crane necessarily, I always reach out and say, Hey, can I share your information? If you want to save yourself a step, just tell me up front. You can share this with anybody you want to, and I will get it in the hands of employers. Uh, it, it takes me seconds to help out a veteran. Uh, if you're not you know, qualified to work with me at Crane, um, you know, I can give you ideas on how to become qualified or I will get your resume to people who are interested in it, one or the other. And the other thing I want to point out, too, is, you know, I know a lot of folks, when they get out of the military, they've got that GI Bill sitting there or, you know, they want to further their education. There's a lot of great opportunities um, at different companies we work with throughout the state to do both, mm -hmm. to get some work experience and get that education. And if you're Absolutely. trying to figure out what degree you want to get, mm -hmm. and if you've shown an electrical or mechanical engineering degree, you can do some pretty fun stuff. And I got yeah. to go out there, you know, was it six, nine months ago, some shot some sniper rifles and mini guns yeah. stuff like that <laughs> yeah we, you know our internships are phenomenal i mean that's one of the really cool things about our internships too is that uh I, you know I, I love it when i go to a job fair and some kid says hey uh, do you have an internship for the summer because i love to go well no not really i have an internship because at crane the way we work is uh when we hire you as an intern we're essentially hiring you as an employee now if you run off back to school and you go to school in arizona obviously you can't work at crane when you're in arizona right but if you're going to USI or, you know, Evansville or Indiana University, sometimes even uh, uh, Purdue or Rose Holman, um, talk to your manager. As an intern, you can come in and work 20 hours a week and still go to school and uh, still get the benefits and everything. It's a great opportunity. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we have a lot of people who do that that are non-traditional students and they, they roll in just like everybody else. You know, it's just part time uh, when they can come until they graduate. And then once they graduate, um, you automatically get converted to a full-time employee. They, you, know, you don't have to reapply. You know, you're our employee from day one. So it's a great place to work. And I know some of the other organizations around have very similar programs. So. One of the cool things, and you touched on it a little bit, but but the geographic area, given you know yeah. the pay you can make at Crane, yeah, you know, land's cheap out there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it goes a long way what you can make yeah. at Crane. Uh -huh. Yeah, I encourage people at job fairs, especially when I'm out of state. You know, I, I go to Southern California sometimes, you know, and it, it's hard to pry people off of that. It's like a, a, a tick on a dog, you know. But at the end of the day, when you're talking to some young person or a veteran or whoever, and you're like, yeah, I understand that company's going to offer you 120 grand. That sounds spectacular because you're an E6 and you just got your degree. But let me show you bankrate.com here. Let's punch, punch in San Diego 
and Indianapolis because that's the, the best major city to compare. And you'll find out that you really only have to make about 58000 in Indianapolis to have a similar lifestyle. So come to, to a place where they're going to pay you 70 or 80 or, or more, you know, and suddenly you've got a farm with an extra barn and, you know, a, a place to go hunting on your own or whatever. You know, it's, mm-hmm. it's great. It's a great place to live. Yeah. All right. I'll see it. Give it one last chance. See if there's any questions before sure. we uh, before we end today's session. I saw Matt ask what kind of legislative legislative stuff we're getting into. What we're talking to the governor about. Uh, yeah. The short answer is we don't do that. You know, we are a, <laughs> we're a 501c3 nonprofit. We don't uh, we don't lobby. We don't get political or anything like that. Our whole mission is just to help veterans connect with careers, connect with communities, resources, and try and ease that transition process as much as we can and maybe shed some light on some new geographic areas you maybe haven't considered and maybe some new career pathways or educational opportunities you haven't considered. Sure. That's about it. Um, but I think unless something comes in the next few seconds, I think I think we're going to wrap it up. So right. Darren, I really appreciate your time. Uh, Anytime, as Wes. Always. Absolutely. Um, you want to give your, uh, you're on LinkedIn. Right. I am. I'm on LinkedIn. It's T, uh, the first names. It's non-traditional. It's T is in Tango. H E R R O N. Theron. Uh, again, T H E R R O N. Last name's Thomas. Um, you know, you can reach out to me at Crane underscore Recruiting at Navy Mill or look me up on LinkedIn. Uh, I'm I'm a fond user of that thing. Uh, you know, I dig around all the time. I get connections, uh, just like they were talking about earlier. So, yeah, Theron Thomas on LinkedIn or Crane underscore Recruiting at Navy Mill. All right. Thanks, Theron. You Thank bet. you, everybody, yeah. for joining in. Again, we'll we'll try and have these about every two weeks. We've already got some employers lined up for for the next two, I believe. Um, so we'll uh, we'll continue to push that stuff out through um, through our different social media channels. Our website, big deal is that website going live next week. It's going to have a lot of additional functionality, a lot more than our current website has. We're really excited about that. So make sure you check that out. All right, as always, feel free to reach out to any of us at any point. We are definitely here to help. Guess have a good day. See you.